morning. <laughs> I was like, good morning, good afternoon, what time? Good day is always a safe one. Good to be back. Some folks I remember from last year, a lot of you are new to me. Um, but want to take a moment for us to do some listening. And so if everyone could just kind of stop rustling papers and just pay attention for a moment. I want you to listen, then I want you to tell me what you hear. What did you hear? Birds? Church in the springtime? Ooh, I like that. Okay, what else? Bubbling brook, yeah? Church bells? Did anyone hear the cricket? Someone? Yeah, okay. Did anyone hear the clock ticking? Okay. Anyone hear the people laughing? I see some curious look. Yeah, that was all in there too. That that had a clicking, t uh, ticking clock, laughter, birds, a bell, crickets, rain, and the bubble. The bubbling stream was actually popping bubbles. Um, reason I played that is sometimes life is kind of like that. We've got sounds coming at us from all kinds of directions, whether it's stuff coming over our iPod, stuff coming through the computer, stuff coming over TV, parents yelling us at, at us from downstairs, teachers yelling at us from wherever, and just noise, 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 and distractions. And when it's like that, it's really, really hard to hear the voice of God. You know, like in this thing, if for some, someone heard the cricket, but a lot of folks didn't hear the cricket or hear the ticking of the clock. And sometimes in the midst of all of the noise and distractions, God's voice is coming through at that kind of a level. God usually isn't shouting at us. It's usually something quiet, something of a whisper. And so how, what do we need to do to block out all of that other stuff so that we can hear the still, quiet voice of God? And so that's what we're going to talk about today, spiritual disciplines. And the, the minute you say spiritual disciplines, some people, they're like, freeze up. It's like, discipline, oh no, because it has such a connotative attitude. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but my brother, discipline probably wasn't his favorite word because he got lots of it. Um, and because he's always doing something wrong. So he, my brother needed to be firmly disciplined. Um, and he thinks, he, now that he's grown, he thinks it was a good thing. And it also prepared him for the service, where there is, in the military, a lot of discipline. But we're not going to talk about the discipline that hurts. We're going to talk about the other kind of discipline. And so for me, discipline isn't a dirty word. I think it's a word we need to get comfortable using. Because when I look at discipline, or when I define it, all I see for discipline, or the way I would define it, is focused attention. Just paying attention to something and being very intentional about that. Um, one of my favorite things to do, and Sandy Kraft would vouch for this, I love to exercise. I just, I love to exercise. But the other thing about exercise is it's a discipline. You know, I, God gave me one body. And the way I figured if I don't take care of this body, I'm out of luck. Because if it fails, I got nothing else in the closet. So I'm working on this body to keep it healthy, to keep it strong, so it can keep doing the work that God has called me to do. And so part of my discipline of self-care is exercise. So every morning, year-round, my alarm goes off at 6. I get up about 6.15, get dressed, eat a, drink a protein shake or have a banana covered with almond butter, put on my, well, this time of year, put on my, my head head thing that covers my head, my neck, and my face, my helmet, two pairs of gloves, my, my biking jacket. I tie up the bottom of my pants and I hop on my bike and make the two mile ride to my gym year round. People say, you ride in the winter? Well, yeah, um, unless there's too much snow that gets in the way. So, you know, I'll ride all year round as long as I have a bike. But so my discipline is get up, get on my bike, get down to the gym, spend about an hour or so there. When I started, I've been at this gym about a year. When I started last year, um, you know, I had worked out a lot. 
um, but this was a very different kind of a workout. It's called CrossFit. And <laughs> Sarah's laughing. Sarah knows CrossFit. <laughs> um, they use CrossFit to, tr to train special ops people, military, police officers, firemen, people like that. Well, I started CrossFit last year. And when I started, um, I remember we were the f one of the exercises we were learning was um, deadlifts, which is, you know, you have a weight on the ground, you spin over it, you get it, and you pick it up. Well, I was new to the gym, so I had to start with 45 pounds. Um, tried to do 65. <laughs> didn't happen. It did not happen. That bar wasn't moving an inch. Well, that was a year ago. Now my personal record for deadlifts is 255. Yeah, whoa. I was pretty shocked, too, when I did it. When I was able to lift my own body weight, that was pretty amazing. But when I was able to lift 255 pounds, I almost, I fell on the floor laughing because I couldn't believe it. But it wasn't there because I wished it. It wasn't, I couldn't do it because I willed it. It was there because of the discipline of being at the gym every morning and doing the practice my body needed so that it could lift that weight. Spiritual disciplines are doing those things that we need to do so that we can be in that stronger, better relationship with God and so that we can hear God more clearly. Um, deadlifts take practice. They take focus. Being in relationship with God and hearing God's still, talk, still quiet voice takes practice and takes focus. And so when I say, when I think of spiritual disciplines, for me, it's all about intentional focus being willing and ready to hear the voice of God um, that's going to come quietly and come through a variety of means. And as United Methodists, we have those things called the means of grace. And we use and those are the disciplines, the spiritual disciplines that we practice so that we can hear God speak, so that we can pay attention and see where God is leading us and in what direction God wants us to follow. And so does anyone know what the spiritual disciplines are? Can you name one or two or all or some? This is not a rhetorical question. Fasting, prayer, reading the Bible, meditation, Eucharist, and I think family prayer, what was it? Celebration. I think celebration can be sacramental. And I think that's also a way that God can speak to us. Yeah. And okay. But those are our spiritual disciplines. And so we, those are the things that we practice on a regular basis to hear God speak and to seek God's direction. And, and, and those disciplines involve a lot of listening. You know, it's, it's hard to hear God when we're, you know, basically, basically, continuously talking, 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 talking. God can't get a word in edgewise. But through the disciplines, the, it causes us to take the time to step back and to put ourselves in a listening mode and just kind of tape up our mouths and let God speak. And then our listening and hearing God. One of the methods that I like a lot in terms of um, spiritual disciplines, you know, John, John Wesley put a, put a priority on prayer and on scripture reading. And with the prayer, you know, there's so, so many ways of praying. And some of those ways involve a lot of talking. One of the things I'm going to give to you or share with you today is a method of prayer that involves very little talking and a lot of listening and a lot of meditation. How many of you are familiar with Tese? Oh, okay. Well, not many. Youth leaders, you need to take your kids to Taizé, France to experience it. So when you, if your youth leader is in here, tell them they need to take you there. Um, it's a, youth from across the globe descend on Taizé um, during the summers every year. You get, I was there three years ago, um, and they let me come as an old person. But, you know, you have to kind of get special permission as an adult because they're, they, they're set up for youth and young adults. And the youth come, they spend a week there, and it's all about prayer, meditation, and listening, and being quiet and still so that God can speak. Um, and so their prayer practice is one of singing meditative songs. And they're short little choruses that you sing over 
and over and over again. And as you're singing those songs over and over again, they go deeper and deeper and deeper within your spirit, allowing the, God, the spirit of God to go deeper and deeper into your spirit so that you're able then to hear what message God might want to speak to you through that song. And then there are times of just being silent. You'll sing this, this song for several minutes and then just remain silent for several minutes. And then maybe there's a scripture, um, scripture passage, very little in terms of a, a, a sermon or, or homily, but a very short, short message and more singing, more meditation, and just listening to where God will speak. And the chapel is beautiful. It's just, it's lots of candles, very few lights, um, and it's dark, so there aren't windows, and there aren't pews, and there aren't chairs. Everyone sits on the floor either on pillows or on using prayer benches, if you've ever seen those. If you have not, ask your youth leader help you to make one because they're very easy, three pieces of wood. Um, using prayer benches or prayer kneelers. Um, and the youth and young adults are just there on the floor. And, and if you can imagine this large space, beautifully lit with candles, with about 1,000 or 2,000 youth and young adults from around the world singing these songs together. And the songs come from around the world. So everyone, no matter where they come from, sing the, sing the songs in whatever language is being sung. And so if it's an English song, we all sing it in English. If it's a French song, we all sing it in French. If it's a Portuguese song, we all sing it in Portuguese. One of my favorite ones was a Portuguese one. But everyone's singing and meditating together. Some of those songs are in your United Methodist hymnal. Some are in the faith we sing. Um, but I'm going to show you a method of teze. And so that when you're looking for a means of prayer and meditation and just listening to God, you'll have this in your toolbox, if you will, as something that you can pull out and use. Teze is great to do on your own, um, individual for individual prayer. It's also very great for group prayer in your youth group or with your family or with a group of friends. And... If you're interested in knowing more about it and, or doing a Teze prayer service, you can pick up this little book called Worship Feast. And it has, and this is what we'll use today, and it has the whole service. And it even has a CD. Most Teze music is done a cappella or with very, very simple instrumentation. You know, a single guitar or single um, keyboard, but not lots of other stuff. And the whole idea of, of it being so that it's just very quiet and meditative and there's not a whole lot of other noise like on the, the track there that's going to get in the way of your hearing what God's going to say. And so we're going to do a little bit of Teze just to, to give you one, one tool that you can use as you move towards building your spiritual disciplines. So I want you, if you want, you can sit on the floor, cross leg. You can lie on the floor, but don't go to sleep. Um, but find a comfortable position. I don't know if anyone can, uh, we're, we're, we're not going to get it too dark in here, but if someone can flip the switch on the lights, that would be nice. If you want to take off your shoes, because most Teze services, people aren't wearing shoes. Um, if you want to take those off, you can. But just get nice and comfortable in whatever comfortable feels like for you. And the first song we're going to do is probably the one I use the most um, as I prepare for prayer because it's one that just really centers me. It's one that's very, very simple, um, not, difficult to he not difficult to learn at all. And the words are, bless the Lord my soul. And, it, and we'll just go through it and through it, and I'll play it so that you can hear it. And the way Teze works is... You just keep listening until and join in when you start to feel able to, to sing the words.
Scripture comes from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, 9 through 10, and 13. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. So I ask you, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. If you know how to give good gifts to your children, How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Prayer is such an important part of faith, and yet it is one of the most difficult disciplines to practice. In this passage, we see that even the disciples were unsure of exactly how to pray. Sometimes we are afraid of seeming selfish by asking for too much. Other times we worry that we're not praying enough. Sometimes we're afraid to pray aloud in front of others. But when we pray alone, we end up falling asleep or realize our mind is wandering. Why is prayer so difficult when Jesus gave us the exact words to say? He says that everyone who asks receives. God wants to shower us with blessings and answers to our prayers, but still we don't commit ourselves to the practice of prayer. What is your prayer life, your prayer life like? Are you satisfied with the time you spend in prayer, or do you desire a deeper prayer life? What is standing in the way of that deeper sense of prayer? Jesus' instructions on prayer seem so simple. Ask and you will receive. Praise God. Pray for daily needs. Pray for others. Pray for forgiveness and the strength to forgive. Ask for the strength to stay out of trouble. Give any glory that is yours on earth to God, who is a true recipient of praise and glory. Think about your attitude towards prayer. Consider Jesus' instructions for prayer and how they can help you move deeper in your prayer life. Examine your prayer life in the remaining silence. Renew your commitment to talking with God regularly. Repeat this phrase, Lord, teach me to pray. And repeat it until you feel a sense of reconnection with God. I'm going to have a few moments of silence.
Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. Draw us into a deeper relationship with you through prayer. Teach us to pray. Amen. You can go back to your seats. Discipline of prayer doesn't have to be painful. Okay, give it a good stretch. <laughs> if you went to Teze, it would be a week of that, starting at 7 in the morning till about 10.30 at night. And then when they have special services, some kids stay in the sanctuary all night until the next morning because um, there's a plenty of space just to relax and just to be in prayer and meditation. But spiritual disciplines, those places, those practices that quiet us and help us to just be very intentional about listening to God. Fasting, you know, there's fasting from food. There's also fasting from noise, fasting from television, fasting from iPods, fasting from a lot of things where we just say, you know, I'm going to take this out of my life to make space for God. And that's what fasting really is. It's just making space for God and being willing to take something out so that God has a place and a time and a, a play, opportunity to speak. Holy communion. Approaching, you know, Holy communion doesn't have to be this boring, dreadful thing, but an opportunity to approach God in a spirit of prayer, saying, God, just speak to me through this sacrament. And then the time of approach, as well as the moments after receiving, where you're able just to reflect on what God has done for us through Jesus Christ and through the gift of the sacrament of Holy Communion. And just using that to, again, allow God to speak and being very intentional about receiving communion on a regular basis. Um, I guess most of your churches receive it once a week. My church, we practice it every week because we just figure it's that important um, that we really need to be talking and listening to God a lot. So we practice communion every week. Many churches once a month. Um, but there may be some place where you're able to receive it on another base um, at another time other than the monthly time that your church offers it. Or you might ask your church, can we have this more often? Um, many Episcopal churches will offer it on a weekly basis. When I lived in Connecticut and in Boston, well, I was serving a Methodist church in both locations, but there was a, an Episcopal in both areas there was an Episcopal church, and I'd go to their early morning communion services so that I could have that time of engaging with the sacrament and being in prayer and listening to God. And then when I was in Boston, actually, I went to their Wednesday morning service and their Saturday morning service um, and just made that practice, that intentional habit of receiving. Um, Christian community worship. 
them, being in worship on a regular basis. God speaks incredible things through worship, through the, the word, through the scriptures, um, through the music, through the preaching. And so to be there to listen to what God is saying, but also to be able to engage with God in the act of worship. Um, healthy living, Christian stewardship, taking care of ourselves, good healthy practices, however you want to take it, is also about intentionality. How do, we, how do we use these bodies as ways of hearing and responding to God and being disciplined about that? You know, I just moved, and so I don't have a refrigerator or stove right now, so my eating disciplines are kind of to the wayside, to put it mildly. Had this big, giant chocolate muffin last night for dessert. But normally, I'm very disciplined about it because in my, in my gym, we all practice something called the paleo diet. And basically, when you're eating paleo, you're eating vegetables and meat. Once in a while, fruit. No breads, no grains, no processed foods, no sugar, nothing like that. Because it's part of our discipline for keeping our bodies fueled properly and healthy so that we can do the physical activities that we do and have, so our bodies can function better. And so it's a discipline that I follow pretty regularly. Like I said, I just moved, so I don't have, I can't keep buying fresh foods because I have nowhere to keep them fresh. Um, but it, we, we, a lot of us are disciplined around paleo eating. Um, I may have to, depending on what's for lunch today, I might have to continue to keep it out the window for a while. So if there's chocolate chip cookies, you'll know why I'm eating them because they're there. Um, but, the, but healthy living. So prayer, being disciplined, being intentional, paying attention to God through prayer, paying attention to God through reading our Bibles on a regular basis. God speaks amazing things through the scriptures. And we could read the same passage over and over and over and over again. And each time God's going to have a different message for us. And so being focused about that. Fasting, Holy Communion, Christian living, healthy living. I'm going to give you all a little, you can trim it down to use it as a bookmark or whatever. It's called Growing in Grace. It's just a card that has um, John Wesley's means of grace or spiritual disciplines. And he put, them, put things in a couple of categories. The works of piety and the works of mercy. Piety being those things that we're doing with ourselves to grow in relationship with God and to grow deeper in our spiritual life. And then the works of mercy, those things that we're doing for other people, because that's a part of our spiritual life as well. It's not a just about me, me, me. It's about how do I relate to God and take that relationship and build it through other and with other people. So feel free to take one or two or as many as you want. I, if there are, as long as there aren't over 80 people, I think everyone should be able to get one. Um, comments, questions? Taze is T A I Z E. And it's in, um, it's kind of in the middle of France. It was founded by Brother Roger, who, wasn't a, who, who was a Protestant layperson and wanted a place where people from different faiths could come together to be focused on prayer. And so it's in Taze, France. And like I said, when you go, there are just thousands of youth from around the world who are there for the, for the retreats. And even though they're all speaking different languages, they find a way to communicate and just have a fantastic time together. It's a good week if you can, if you can get your church and your youth group to, to agree to do with it. Warren. There is a sponsored event out of the New York yes. Conference. So if you're interested in going, I have information about that. It is about 2,500 of the yeah, Bishop Devadar loves Taze. <laughs> Um, Bishop Devar takes a group of youth every summer, and his goal was to be able to take 100 people every year. He's, so he's been doing it for 
because when I was there, he was there with a group, and so I saw people I knew while I was in France, which was great. Uh, but he had brought about 70, 60 or 70 that year, but wants to be able to bring a group of about 80. And it's a tremendous spiritual experience, and you really just get to focus in on listening. And it's a very disciplined time, too, in, in, a, in a very intentional time in terms of prayer several times a day, Bible study, workshops, and just spending that time listening to God. It's a beautiful area, so there are lots of places just to go and sit under the trees and sit under the grass to pray or take notes. One of the other things that helps with your listening as you're reading scripture and praying is to keep a notebook close by. So that as you have insights, as you have inspirations, you can jot those down and then be able to go back and review them and see how God was speaking through that or what God was speaking from that for you. Other comments or questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, but your spiritual disciplines, your, your intentional practice of listening to God and paying attention to God, um, it can be a very relaxing, very rewarding, very fulfilling experience as you hear where God is calling you and how God wants to shape your life. Amen? Excellent.